Uh, good morning, grade 12, class of 2020, geography. Um, I'm Mr. Jangase. I am from Ichabiseng High School. And today I will be presenting for you geography paper 2. Um, so the first thing that you must uh, remember about this paper is that you need all your material that you need to have. Uh, including your ruler, your calculator, your protractor, and your pencils. So I will be taking you for paper two today, and hopefully we will enjoy uh, the lesson today. Um, I will be using the two maps. The maps that I will be using is the map of um, uh, Pongola, the one that you were using last year, the one that was uh, used by the matrix of last year, which is Pongola, and then I will also be using the map of Peter Marispec. The reason why I chose these maps is because they are the, ma the maps that are most accessible to people right now, uh, since we, uh, they were used in 2018, this one, and this one was used in 2019. Um, so I'm going to go straight to the paper, grade 12. Uh, the first thing that I want to start with is, is, the, is, the, is the layout of the paper. Your paper, grade 12, will be a, a heaven. First, you will have multiple choice question, which is out of 15 marks. And then you will have map work and calculations. Map calculations and techniques, which is 20 marks. You know that is where you need mostly your rulers, your protractor. Uh, that is also where you need to have your pencils because you will be uh, using the maps. Question three. We'll have application and interpretation of the map. This is where I will spend most of the time today in interpretation and application because this is where most of you guys are actually struggling to understand and then there's a GIS which is geographical information systems which is for 15 max and when you think about the geographical information system that is when you'll be talking about your components of GIS that's when we'll be talking about your data layering. That is when we'll be talking about the application of GIS. Which is how do we use the GIS? So the, the total marks for the paper is 75 marks. Uh, so grade 12, I will go straight to uh, the paper. First of all, I want to highlight that I will not do multiple choice question because they actually form part of your interpretation but you know that in those questions mostly that is where you actually have a you identify where is the auto the auto photo map and you also have to know things like the contour interval of a topographical map you also need to know things like uh, the contour interval of the auto photo map the contour index you also know things like the index to sheet. So grade 12, um, first things first here in, in this paper, grade 12, you must always... Now, this is very important that you, you, you read your instructions, grade 12. You must read your instructions. The instructions are very, very important. If you do not read your instructions, you will struggle to answer uh, these question, this question papers of paper 2. Normally, our colleagues or the teachers or your teacher has already given you a fully fleshed paper for paper 2. So, there are instructions in that paper. At most, these instructions, grade 12, they are the same instruction. It's just that it changes the map code and the map that we'll be using. That, uh, For example, here we've got uh, the map of Pongola as an example. So if you read the ones that you have, the paper that you will see on the third, on your paper two, will be having the same instruction but different map code and everything, okay? So you must also always read the general information. Do not skip the general information, grade 12, because three, 
marks actually comes from the general information. There are about three marks that comes from the general information. Now, great of the moment you get your paper, I will, this is now my personal advice that I want you to, to, to actually follow in this matter. You receive your paper, you get your paper for writing, and then they say you may start reading. You read through your paper. Once you are done, grade 12, I, I, I encourage you to actually open your maps. You must open your map and just navigate through your map. Take your time and look at your map. You must take your time and look at your map carefully so. Because now, um, you find that just by looking at the map, grade 12, and navigating yourself, you, you, you identify, as you look at your map, you identify where is the CBD of Pomola. From there, you identify, oh, there is the rural urban fringe because there is an aerodrome. There is an aerodrome, so there is a, a, a rural urban fringe. Where are the mountains in this map? You ask yourself those questions. You look at this map. Oh, Pongola is in KZN. It means that it falls under the eastern side of um, the country, meaning that they have high rainfall. You look at the, at the route that passes Pongola, there is N2. Okay, how will N2 benefit the people of Pongola? These are the questions that you ask yourself before you even go and answer the questions. You look at the, the stream patterns, you look at the street patterns, you look and look, go around, you see your map, you navigate, you look at your scale, you look at your keys and symbols, it's very important that you look at all your keys and symbols, and then from there, you also look at your uh, information that you need for your um, for your uh, magnetic declination, uh, the index to sheets. You also look at all those things, Great 12, and also go through your uh, auto photo map and do just the same. So, Great 12, um, now these are the very important things to remember in your paper. Measure distance as accurately as possible. Grade 12. This is very important. Sometimes I understand that the paper seems to be easy. So you then become very excited. You see that you have to just measure area. You become so happy. You forget to measure accurately. And you should also know all your formulas in geography. You just know them. Know that the formula for area is length times breadth. Know that uh, also you need to use the correct scale. In an auto photo map is 1 is to 10,000. In a topographical map you use 1 is to 50,000. And this is a very very important step now that says do not only write down the answer. Show all your calculations grade 12 because marks will be allocated for all the steps. Always use a calculator in your map work. Right? Well, for this thing of not carrying a, a, a calculator when you go to your paper two is a problem because you end up uh, getting something that you already know. You get it wrong because you did not use a calculator. Um, do not rush, Great right? Twelve. You need to relax. Okay, this is very important. You need to relax. Do not rush. As I was saying, you don't get overexcited on the paper. You see that how they say I must calculate area. So you become excited, grade 12. You don't calculate them accurately. You don't measure your distance accurately. You must relax. Do not rush. Okay? Always use the correct unit of measurement. Very important. Always use. Look at the calculation. Look at the question. The examiner says calculate distance in kilometers. Or maybe the examiner says Calculate distance in meters. You must always look at the question and use the correct measurements. Uh, remember, practice makes perfect. Great 12. Alright, so uh, I'm going to start with the, um, uh, the calculations first. The first thing that I'm going to present for you now is the calculations. 
Uh, in geography, we have uh, six calculations that are, are mostly uh, examined. Actually, these are the calculations for geography. Okay. The first calculation that you have is distance. So distance is when you measure distance from point A to point B. There is the formula for distance. You say map distance times scale. And the, uh, the unit of measurements must be in kilometers or meters, depending on what the examiner is saying you must uh, write your answer, your final answer as. Okay. And then you look at area, the very important question in geography also, in paper two. Area is equal to length times breadth. So your area is length times breadth. And the unit of measurement, it means that your answers must be in meter squared or in meter squared. And then from there, grade 12, you, you, you will be looking at gradient. Gradient, the formula, vertical interval over horizontal interval, which is height over distance. Now, this formula that says gradient is equal to height over distance is the most easiest formula to remember, grade 12. A magnetic declination, of course, we know that for magnetic declination, we always have to use this information on our maps. It's very important that you know where to get the information. This is the information that we use for the magnetic uh, declination. So, all the time, you must be able to find that information. And then the, form, the, the, the following one is the magnetic bearing. Now the magnetic bearing says the magnetic declination plus the bearing, the true bearing, meaning that the angle that you need to measure on the map, grade 12. And then from there, the last calculation is vertical exaggeration. Now the vertical exaggeration, grade 12, um, the formula there says vertical scale over horizontal scale. All right, grade 12. Um, these are the, this is the summary of all your calculations. Now, the first thing that you need to understand when it comes to calculations, grade 12, is that we need to know the scale of the map. The scale of the topographical map, for example, uh, we have a scale of the orthophoto map on the other hand. This is the topographical map in front of you right now. The scale of the topographical map, one centimeter is to 50 centimeters. Now, this is set in centimeters. The following one says one centimeter is equal to 500 meters. And the other one says one centimeter is equal to 0 0.5 kilometers. This is just conversion. When I convert these scales into meters or I convert the scale into kilometers. Now you remember that these scales, you must know how to actually multiply them. When they say calculate area in meters, you multiply by 500. If they say calculate area in kilometers, you multiply by 0, 0,5. The other photo map on the other hand, you have one is to 10,000, same thing that I was explaining there, one is to uh, uh, 100 meters, and one centimeter is to uh, 0, 0,1 kilometers. Now, this is just a conversion. The normal scale, that is why I highlighted it today in red, that, that is the scale that you'll see in your map. One centimeter is to 50 meters, jalo 50,000 centimeters. And then the auto photo would be saying one centimeter is to 10,000 centimeters. Now this you must have a look on it that if the answer must be in kilometers, you must multiply by 0 0.5 on a topographical map. If your answer must be in meters, you must multiply by 500 on the topographical map. But on the auto photo map, you multiply by 0, 0,1. And then uh, 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 you multiply by 100 if you change to meters. All right. Now, Great I'm going to go straight to my calculations. Um, the first calculation that I'm going to be looking at now is area. Area. If we go to the uh, question, uh, the map of Pomola, there is an area covered by the orthophoto map on the topographical map. 
So the question that I have here says refer to the demarcated area in red on the topographical map which represents the orthophoto map. Use the demarcated area to calculate the area of the orthophoto map in kilometer squared. Show all your calculations because marks will be awarded for calculations in this case. So the first thing that you need to do grade 12 in this case is that you write down your formula if it's not given to you. Normally the formula will be given to you but if it's not there then that means that you have to write down the formula as length times breadth. The first thing you work with grade 12 is your length. Remember grade 12 the length is always the longest side when you calculate area. Always remember that it doesn't matter the shape. The longest side we call it as the length. So our length here, you want, if you want to get your length, you take your ruler, grade 12. You take your ruler. Remember to take your ruler. That's why I said to you, you must always have your rulers. You take your ruler. And you are going to measure the distance of the length in centimeters. Remember that you have to measure the distance of your of your length in centimeters. I'm not going to focus on the, on, on doing it practically with you here because I have it on the computer on my presentation. Mara, you can see here that uh, the, the it's, it's approximately 9.9. .9. Actually, you always use this side uh, so that you get the accurate measures there. Uh, as you can see here my length will be a 9.9 .9, uh, centimeters so once you have that you take your ruler as i was saying there is my ruler i get 9.9 .9. there is my accurate measurement and then i must multiply it by 0 0.5 kilometers because grade 12 i am working with the uh, the topographical map and the answer must be in kilometers. This is why I'm multiplying by 0, 0,5. All right. And then the answer that you get there is 4.95. And then you go and uh, measure your breadth. You also do the same thing, great. Well, you take your ruler, you put it in your uh, topographical map, and the, the distance that you're going to get there is 7.3 centimeters. Then you take that 7.3 centimeters and you multiply it by 0, 0,5. And the answer that you are going to get is going to be 3.65. Now you have already worked out the length and the breadth. Now you remember that the formula says area is equal to length times breadth. And then you take these two, your length and the breadth, you multiply them together. 4.95 kilometers times 3.65 kilometers and your final answer would be 18.07 kilometers kilometer squared grade 12 very important to write your unit of measurement correctly that is um 18.07 uh, kilometers okay now you remember grade 12 that if you were to calculate this in an orthophoto map, it means that we now if it was on the orthophoto map, you would be multiplying by 0, 0,1. Okay, because the answer must be in kilometers. So this is how you calculate your your area, grade 12. Uh, remember, I said to you, you must relax and work as accurately as possible. Because there's nothing worse than going out of the examination and all excited I'm like I, I got it right Mara you did not because you you did not measure correctly all right so now the following question here says the area demarcated in red on the topographical map represent the area covered by the orthophoto map why do the features on the orthophoto map look larger than the same features on the topographical map. Now, let's look at these uh, features that they are talking about here. Um, here is my uh, topographical map. You see this map? Here is my topographical map. 
they are heavy. This is the area that I'm looking at. This one, you can see. This area is re all of this area is represented in this one, in this map now. In this one. And this is your your what? This is your 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 auto photo map. You can see the features here appear to be bigger. For example, let's compare a uh, uh, the aerodrome of Pongola. We are looking at it from the uh, auto photo map and also looking at it from the topographical map. Now, let me put them side to side here so that you can see. All right, I hope this is clear to you. Um, this is the aerodrome. This is the aerodrome. There you have it. This is the aerodrome. On the topographical map, there is your aerodrome. All of this. But when you look at it on the auto photo, this is on the topographical map, and you can see this. You can see, Mara. When you look at it from the auto photo map, it is bigger than this one. This aerodrome appears to be bigger than this. Why is that the case, grade twelve? Why do we have such? That's what the question is actually asking you. Um, so there you have it. These are, these are the reasons, grade twelve. It's because of the scale. The scale of the autophoto map is larger or bigger. So the scale of a topographical map is smaller. Remember that the meaning of the scale that says 1 is to 50,000 means that the features has been reduced 50,000 times. But the one that says 1 is to 10,000 means that the features has been reduced 10,000 times. That is why uh, the larger the, 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 the scale of the map, the number, uh, actually uh, the smaller the features on that map. So those are the answers. So in the, 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 the other point says the scale of the auto photo map is five times larger than of the uh, topographical map. Uh, the last answer also speak about the scale that uh, the one for the topographical map is five times smaller than that of auto photo map. All right, grade 12, that is the follow-up question for area. Now, uh, the following uh, calculation that I'm going to do with you now, grade 12, is, is the what? Is the gradient. Um, the gradient, grade 12 says here, calculate the average gradient between benchmark 315.9 in block E7. And the trigonometrical station 75 in block F7 on the topographical map. Show all your calculations. Of course, that is very important. And this question was from the map of Pongola. I, I, I actually uh, uh, took it from the map of Pongola. So if you are having that map right now, you can be looking at these two. Um, and then the first thing that you have, of course, is your formula. Gradient is equal to height over distance and then from there you actually have to work out your height grade 12 this is very important that you work out your height and how do you work out the height you work out the height by taking the highest uh, uh, value the difference and actually you actually what you want to do here is to find the difference in height between these two points now, when you look at this uh, trigonometrical station, let me just pause a bit on the trigonometrical station. Uh, the trigonometrical station, grade 12, uh, is having a triangle and then the station number. There is a station number there which is 75. The height of the trigonometrical station is 473.3. You must never use that 75. That 75 is normally written in, 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 in italic. Uh, you don't use that as your height. That is just a number. Okay? So you always use the, the value with a point something on it. Alright. So this is this is our difference in height. You say 473.3 minus 315.9 and you get 
that is your difference in height then once you work your difference in height you have your height now then you go for your distance the distance of the gradient grade 12 is the distance between the two points that you have in front of you so you take a ruler as you can see here there is my ruler you take a ruler you measure the distance between these two points and then uh, in this case we got 1.8 uh, centimeters now remember these are centimeters grade 12 it means that way now you must convect you must convert these centimeters to meters because grade 12 all all of our of our uh, uh, heights in our topographical maps are in meters your contour lines are in meters your spot heights are in meters your trigonometrical stations are in meters. Your benchmarks are in meters. So it means, therefore, you must convert these to meters so that you get the same unit of measurement. How do we convert it? Remember our scale, we said if we measure distance on a, top, on a topographical map and we want to convert it to meters, we multiply by 0, zero we multiply by 500, as case. we multiply by 500. Then when you say 1,8 times 500, you get 900 meters. Um, the following step here in, in our steps, remember we have to have steps here. The following step says you must divide the height by the height and then divide the distance by the height. So that you end up with an answer of 1 is 2 something you get me grade 12 you must always divide the height by height and then you divide the distance by by height also that is why here we have 157.4 divided by or over 157.4 and then we have 900 over 157.4 and then our final answer will be 1 is 2 5.71 this is how you calculate your gradient now remember let me let me go back let me pause a bit and go back to your to your uh, distance in this case for your distance grade 12 if this was calculated on an orthophoto map it means that you were going to multiply by 100 meters but in this case the question clearly says you must calculate the distance in general the gradient on a topographical map all right uh, is the average gradient between benchmark 315.9 in block e7 and the top of uh, the trichometer station 75 in block F7 on the topographical map, steep or gentle? Give evidence from the orthophoto map to actually elaborate on your answer. Grade 12. When you look at this, the answer is 1 is 2, uh, 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 1 is 2, 5.71. So, this gradient, grade 12, uh, is what? Is steep. When they say you must elaborate, you must elaborate from the map, from the what, from the orthophoto map. When you go to this feature on the orthophoto map, there I have it displayed in front of you. You can see that uh, the, 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 the gradient that was calculated was between this uh, spot height and the benchmark there. So when you look at it from your map also, here in front of you, um, there you have this and just fold this map. There you have it here in front of you. When you look at it now in this situation, you can see that this is steep because the contour lines are actually close to, to each other. When you look at this, there you were you were starting from here, from that point. So uh, this is very important grade 12. Um, uh, let me then move on 
to your answer here the answer says the gradient then between these two is actually what is actually a uh, steep because the control lines as you can see uh, are close to to each other okay the following question that i'm going to look at the calculation is for a magnetic declination it says refer to the information on a topographical map that information on the topographical map grid 12 is very important that you always know where to find that information uh, so i have already displayed it on my on my presentation here there is the information that they are talking about um, the information that we have there uh, says the mean magnetic declination 20 degrees 6 minutes west of true north mean annual change 12 minutes west what all right now what is important before i say anything here is that the mean magnetic declination of 20 degrees six minutes west of true north you use the years the year years there in bracket there's a year that says july 2002 that is the year that you are going to use do not ever ever use those two years that are written at the bottom of that sentence that says 2000 to 2005 never ever use those years all right so the first thing that we do of course i'm, I'm going through your calculation now grade 12 with me please follow me closely the first thing, difference in years. Because this map was, uh, uh, this calculation was actually done last year. You say 2019 minus 2002 and you get 17 years. Uh, and now you must remember when they say calculate the magnetic declination for the present year, it means that you are going to use what, which year? 2020 because it's a present year but in this case right now we are calculating it uh, based on uh, this map uh, of last year which is the uh, Pomona 2019 that is why we say 2019 minus 2002 and we get 17 years the following thing grade 12 the following step here says that the main annual change these marks grade 12 are free marks look you just go to the map and take that information it's written for you it is given there is the information there is the information that i'm talking about you see the the, the, the 12 minutes is just given to you it's a free mark you just write the mean annual change and then you go there and you take it and you write it down and you get the mark just for doing that grade 12. so you cannot really lose those marks uh, in this situation in this in this in this mat so this is your mean annual change as you can see is 12 minutes west the following uh, step you must actually calculate the total change how do you calculate the total change you take the difference in years the years that you got from that step you multiply it by the mean annual change and then in this case you we, we got a uh, 204 minutes Remember, when you multiply the 17 years times 12, you're going to get your answers in minutes. And then now we have a situation whereby we have a 204 minutes. And you will know that uh, uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to minutes, we cannot have 204 minutes. We have to have, uh, the minutes must be less than 60. The minutes must not be over 60. Even in your clock, in your time, when you count, a, you reach an hour after 60 minutes. So it becomes, so in this case of our geography here, if it's above 60, it actually makes a what? A degree. So that is why what, what, what happens here is that they have worked out, we have worked out the what? The number of degrees um, uh, that we have there. Uh, so how do we do this how do i prefer to do this now look at my demonstration here what i'm going to do i prefer that when i have 204 for example what i must do is to take that 204 and always minus 60 minutes in it and when i minus a, a, a 60 minutes in that i actually put it in my hand and say 
in my hand I have a degree now. I have a degree. If that number is still above 60, I minus another degree. And if I minus the degree, how many degrees I have now in my hand? There are two degrees now. That number was still above. If the number is still above 60, I minus another degree. I put it in my hand again. I have how many degrees in my hand now? I've got three degrees. How many minutes am I left with? I'm left with uh, 24 minutes. It means that now, this is why in bracket here, I put three degrees that are away in my hand and then the remaining uh, 24 uh, uh, minutes, grade 12. So you must always work. Actually, uh, what I always say, grade 12, is that it is very important to use the method that works best for you. Okay? Now let's go back to our presentation. Uh, so the magnetic declination for 2019, therefore, you're going to say uh, you come to the map again. Uh, you take your change here. Uh, it says 20 degrees 6 minutes west of two north. You take that information. You take that information, grade 12. You put it down and then you, 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 you add because the angle, they said that it is going west. If the angle is going west, you always add the value. Let me demonstrate this to you. What does it mean to actually add or subtract? If I have an angle here of the, of the magnetic declination, I have something like this. And then, um, okay. And then this is your true north, and this is your magnetic north. Remember why our compass needle will not point. Our compass needle, when we measure, uh, when we when we look at our compass, it does not uh, direct us to the true north here. It, it is always uh, directing us to this magnetic node because of the magnetic field on the north pole. So you always uh, be directed away from the true node. Now, the, when the angle is saying to be going west, let me demonstrate this of west and east. If the angle is coming to the west side, this is your west side and this is your east side, east. It means that if the angle is going is moving westward, coming to this side, it is increasing here because it's coming from here and it's going towards the west. Mara, if the angle is coming towards the east, that angle will be actually coming towards here. And you see this angle is now smaller than before. If it was here originally and it went west, it was going to come all the way to this side. Mara, if it comes east, it's from here to this side. So that is why we minus the angle when it's coming to this side. And then we add the angle if it's coming to, to this side. Okay, 12. I hope it makes sense. Um, now let's go back to our, our presentation. Uh, you can see here that uh, we have added because the change was westward. So we took our, 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 our information of the magnetic declination of 20 degrees 6 minutes plus 3 degrees 24 minutes that um, uh, 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 we got when we were calculating the total change. And then grade 12 from there, you must always write that it is going west of true north if it's going west of true north your answer must always have that west of true north all right um now grade 12 the following question that we have in our in our uh, um, a question paper for a uh, pongola 2019 is that we have to determine the magnetic bearing for 2019 from trigonometrical station 89 in block C7 to 
Trigonometric station 83 in block B9. Great Wolf, we already calculated this. Now, let, let, let me show you this. The first thing that you need to do, Great 12, there is always a point where they say from. For example, they say determine the magnetic bearing for 2019 from. You say that from is very, very important. That from. That is where you are working from. You start working from there. Let me show you here, okay? Let me say, maybe I say, uh, the question says, um, determine the true bearing of A from B. And then you've got, for example, of A from B, say I have A, and then I have B somewhere here from B it means that what I must do first I must put a cross from the point where they say from this is what you do grade 12 you put a cross on the point where they say from once you have that cross you join those two points you join them you join them and then from there, that is where you have to use your protractor to actually uh, measure the angle. You remember, you move also in a clockwise direction. So in this case, I've already made, uh, done that. You can see from this map, they say from uh, the trigonometric station 89. I put my cross on trigonometric station 89 in block C7. There you have a cross. And then I've joined it with uh, the triple master station 83 in block B9. There you have them. And then what I must do now is that I must put down my formula. My formula says magnetic bearing is equal to true bearing plus the magnetic declaration. Now this question grade 12 is normally in um, um, six marks for example. You know you don't need to get zero here just because you do not have your protractor. Okay, some people would say they did not have a protractor on the exam, so this is why they did not get this calculation correct. But you don't have to get zero in this calculation if you do not have a protractor. Because what you must remember, now look at my presentation there closely. You must remember that we have already calculated the, the, uh, the, the, what? the magnetic declination. And we call it as 23 degrees 30 minutes west. You must remember that there you have it. Let me show you. There we have it. There is our magnetic declination. There is our magnetic declination, grade 12. So in this case now, when they say we must calculate the, 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 the magnetic bearing, it means that we already have uh, the what? The magnetic declination. If you do not have the magnetic declination, start by calculating the magnetic declination. Okay. Now let's go back to our calculation. We already have this. What we need to determine now, we have to determine the true bearing. How do we determine the true bearing? We take our protractor. Follow my presentation, look at the diagram. You take a protractor, you place it in your cross. Remember your cross where you said, uh, calculate it in a way you drew your cross. You place it in a clockwise direction, in a vertical uh, uh, manner, do not place it horizontally. You must place it up from o'clock because this thing is said to be moving in a clockwise direction. So your zero must be at 12 o'clock. If I'm, I will use a time phrase, would it, it must be on 12 o'clock. Then you move in a clockwise direction from there to determine the angle. In this case right now, we have our magnetic bearing as 56 degrees. We have our true bearing as 56 degrees. When I measure from there, from 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50, 56. Okay? Once I have that, I have to remember the formula says magnetic bearing is true bearing plus magnetic uh, declination. 
So from there, I already have this. Now there is my uh, uh, magnetic declination. I put it there, as you can see. So now I've got uh, the answer that will be um, nine, uh, 79 degrees 30 minutes. Uh, 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 this is your answer, grade 12. This is your, your answer, there is 79 degrees 30 minutes. You must always try to work these things out, grade 12. But the most important thing there is that you do not get zero in such because you do not have a protractor. In fact, the first thing that I said to you was that you must always have your protractor with you. You must always have all your gears that you need in geography. You must always have them for paper two. Okay, the vertical exaggeration question, grade 12, I will cover it towards the end. I have got a reason because I want us to look at the at the, the, uh, the, 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 the interpretations uh, first. And then when we look at the interpretations, that's when we're actually going to look more on the what? On the vertical exaggeration. I've got a reason for that. And I hopefully uh, you will see why I did uh, just that, uh, grade 12. Okay. Now, um, this section, interpretation of a map, grade 12, is your question 3. This is application and interpretation. It consists of 25 marks in total. This is where we lose marks as learners. There. This is where we lose marks. How do we lose marks? I do not know. Because this section, grade 12, has to do with your knowledge this section has to do with your knowledge of theory everything that you have done in in in, in what in your theory will be then um, asked in your application it means therefore grade 12 you must know your theory part an examiner will ask you questions on interpretation but those questions will be based on theory will be based on theory in fact it is so easy to ask these questions in a way that you can take any map of any of any of any map in the in the country any province and ask the same questions as Pongol just by saying refer to the map actually the examiner there is asking you the theory section but is saying refer it on the map so that is why you will never be able to answer this question if you do not know your, your 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 theory part when you look at this the way i have divided these questions now the way i was selecting them from peter maris question paper and the um the what and the 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 the, the, the pongola question paper is that i have categorized them as climatology these are there are climatological questions there there's geomorphology, there's settlement geography, and there's economic geography. You will see that all these questions that you're about to see now, they all have to do with this climatology, geomorphology, settlement geography, and economic geography. So I will cover some of those uh, 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 questions. I will cover some of those questions in this uh, 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 um, a presentation now now let's look at this the first question says the bottom of the valley at area M on the topographical map experiences frost during the early hours of the morning in winter this is the question that I, I got from the um, Peter Marisberg uh, question uh, map question paper and then 3.1 says you must actually name the local or tertial winds that is responsible for the formation of frost. Name the local tertial wind that is responsible for the formation of frost. All that the examiner is asking you here is about what the catapatic winds. The, lo the, the local winds there that's from frost is the catapatic winds or sometimes they say it's gravitational winds or gravitational wi or, or downslope winds. So the question really 
is about catapatic or anapatic and in this case the answer is catapatic it means that if you do not know your catapatic wins you are going to struggle to answer this question now let's look at the following question explain how the wind mentioned in question 3.1.1 cause frost this question here is asking you about the formation of frost in your theory part so now they're asking you Uri, how do we have the formation of frost how do how do catapatic winds f cause a uh, uh, frost in the veil this is your veil climate anchor so there you have it these are the answers that you have even in your theory the slopes cool down resulting in air in contact with the slope cooling down the cooler air becomes heavy and dense cooler air subsides down the valley slope and then the other answer says cooler air accumulates on the valley floor trapped by the invasion the cold subsiding air cools the temperature to below freezing point that last point grade 12 is very very important that last point that is the point that you will always remember how do we have the formation of frost in the veil the cold the, the cold subsiding air cools the temperature Low freezing point. That is how we have frost in the bottom at the bottom of the veil. Alright. Now I hope and Kratos, you understand uh, what I was trying to say in this point that we need to know our uh, our valley climates. Uh, now this is 3.5. This question is coming from the Pongola. A, a, a 2019 question paper it says refer to the segment Pakamisa and Legend below situated in the valley in block J4 on the topographical map now this is the, uh, 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 the, the place that they are talking about the Pakamisa when you look at Pakamisa the first question says in which direction does the segment of Pakamisa face. In which direction? Now, grade 12, let me let me pause here a bit. This question is about what? This question is about the aspect. This question is about the aspect of the slope. And we know in geography, when we speak of aspect, we have two aspects, uh, 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 the direction in which the slope is facing. We normally speak about the north facing slope and the south facing slope that is aspect that is the definition of aspect so this this is a, a climatological question that asks you about the aspect of the of the slope in this case pagamisa is actually facing north you can see the control lines there of pagamisa pagamisa is a north facing slope and now you remember that the north facing slope in the southern hemisphere are the slopes that a, 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 a suitable for 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 what for segment because uh, they are the warmest uh, slopes explain the climatological advantage of the location of the segment of pagamisa all the examiner that is asking you here is a uh, to explain how is this north facing slope is the one that is always suitable in the a, a, a southern hemisphere and the answers there will range from is the warmest part of the slope as it is receiving the direct uh, radiation from the sun a pagamisa segment is located in the thermal belt it means that it is in the middle uh, of, of the slope when you look at the the, the, the segment itself um, so the, therefore the slope uh, is warmer 
at night. There is gonna be a limited effect of the catapatic flow due to, to location. Remember the catapatic grade 12 will affect people who are actually down slope. If we are down slope, that is when you will be affected by catapatic the most because that is where at the bottom of the veil there will be accumulation of frost and frost pockets. And also radiation fog happens there. So it becomes uh, 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 cold. You cannot plant some certain plants there at the bottom of the veil. And also, uh, the, here you can see that the sediment is not affected by frost or cold nights because it is uh, located on the middle of the slope. There will be no uh, uh, effects of catapatic as the, the, the answer I've said already. Um, okay, this one is also important that the reason why people don't actually build on top of the mountains because there will be cross winds and on top of the mountains. So, Pagamisa is located in the middle. It means that it is not affected by the, uh, the cross winds on top of the mountains. All right, correct, 12. And then, uh, the following uh, uh, question says, refer to the Pongola River. On the topographic map now this question grade 12 what must come to your mind about this question is that this question is a geomorphological question because they are now asking you about the river and we know that we've got our rivers in geomorphology section of our uh, theory uh, uh, geography The question says, what type of a river is Pongola River? There is our river. Uh, there is our river. Now, remember, grade 12, when we speak about the, 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 the rivers that we have on our topographical map, if you look at our keys, uh, there we have our keys, our references or our symbols for our map. Um... This is the, uh, the, the, the perennial river or the permanent river. And then compare it to the non-perennial river. You can see that it will have dotted lines. This one, the non-perennial river. But this one is solid blue. When you look at your map now, here, you can see that the, in, on the map clip, the Pongola River is having solid blue, meaning that this is... Uh, uh, what type of a river is this one? Is a perennial river, grade 12, because it is having solid blue. It's blue all over there. It means that it flows throughout the year. And one of the things that you must remember, grade 12, is this. When you look at your maps, what I have noticed about your maps is that the other map will be from the western part of the country. For example, Kimbal. You will have Kimbal. And when you look at Kimbali, the rivers there will be dry, will be uh, non permanent rivers because it is on the western half of the country. And we know that the western half of the country receives less rainfall compared to the eastern side of the country. Now when you look at Pongola, Pongola is, on, uh, is, is in the eastern part of the country where we have lots of rainfall, summer rainfalls there. So, that is why even when you look at the map itself, the map itself of Pongola is, is, is green. This map is green at most. It's green because there is a lot of plantations that side. It is where we have our, our, our highest rainfalls. So that is why you must be having map work awareness as I was saying on my introduction. Um, and let me go back to my uh, presentation. Then you have another question. Will an Ospo Lake be more likely to form first at Meander Loop R or Meander Loop S? And for this you must give a reason for your answer. 
and this question I took it from the Pongola question paper. Now let's look at these meander loops. These are the meander loops that they are talking about here on my presentation. You look at these two meander loops. Let me display it from the map. Much easier to see. Um, now you see here we have the meander loop R loop R and, and meander loop S these two now Kretwolf, the first thing that you should understand is that it is more likely to develop at S as you can see there the reason, the first reason that you, you as, as, as a geography learner, as a geographer, the first reason that should tell you why at S is because when you look at control lines at S, they are far away from each other, these control lines, indicating that the area is gentle. But when you look at the, 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 the control lines at R, you can see that the control lines are close to each other, indicating that the area is deep. Now, remember in Ospolog is when a river cuts, it's not going to take the long way around. It's now going to cut through here. Now, this results in a situation whereby um, this S is where the Ospolog is more likely to happen. Because of the control line. That's the first reason. Because some of these reasons that you, you, you will see from the answers, they are actually, they are not visible. It's just the answers that you should know that uh, if it's going to have an hospital leg, then this is what should happen. So the answer says, uh, let me just go back to the question first. It says, where will the hospital leg form between R or S? The landform at meander loop R is more elevated, as I have explained. It is hilly, there is a hill that is hilly like, while the land at meander loop S is more gentle, meaning that the river can cut through there. S, a reason that S, it has a softer, less resistant rock than R. The naked S is, is more easily eroded than R. There is more resistant rock at meander loop R, which will take longer to erode. And meander uh, neck R is actually wider than meander loop S. So those are the answers, correct 12. But you see, this is a, 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 a geomorphological question. And this geomorphological question is actually just asking you whether you understand the, the formation of, a, of, a, 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 of, of an Ospol Lake. Do you understand the formation of an Ospol Lake or not? That is the question. Okay. Now let's move forward to grade 12. Identify and describe the drainage pattern in block C9, C10, D9, and D10 in the map clip below. Now, I took this map clip specifically because I wanted to ask this question. I, I took it from the Queenstown a question paper. And you can see the uh, when you look at this, now you should focus on the presentation because uh, we don't have... Um, at the map of Queenstown with us, uh, you can see that the flow of this in these four blocks, C9, C10, D9, and D10, they are flowing outward from the central point. That is why the answer says this is a radial stream pattern. Because the streams flow away from a central point. We understand that correct also. The most common uh, 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 stream pattern that you will see in your maps, normally you will see a dendritic stream pattern. You will see a dendritic stream pattern. For example, in this map, 
you will see that most of these stream patterns are dendritic. If you look at this map, if you can see them there, they are dendritic stream pattern. There you have them, uh, some of this here, a dendritic stream pattern. Let me show you. Uh, this is the river here, and then the streams, uh, the tributaries are joining the main river in an acute angle, meaning that this becomes a dendritic stream pattern. Now you must always remember your stream pattern creature when it comes to to, 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 uh, to geomorphology. This is very very important that you know them all. Because these questions on, on stream patterns are common. It, let's look at the stream pattern at P. Stream pattern at P. Now the stream pattern at P, there is P. This is the drainage basin at P. There you have it here, going around here. So when you look at this drainage pattern, is that um, this is a, a what a dendritic stream uh, pattern again. So it, this the dendritic stream pattern is the most common one when it comes to map to maps in South Africa, especially. But here you can have um, also the others, as you have seen in my presentation here. This one was from Queenstown, and this was the radial stream pattern. You must always uh, be aware of them. Your trellis stream pattern, uh, your rectangular stream patterns. Always be aware of such grade 12. All right, let's move forward to grade 12 with our presentation. Um, I refer to the settlement at 10 on the orthophoto map. Settlement 10 on the orthophoto map. There is settlement now. Now, this question grade 12. You remember what I said I would do? I, will, I, I said I would start with climatology and I will, I'm done with the climatology questions there. They are not limited to, the, to that. But what I was trying to show you is that these questions are asking you what you already know. These questions are asking you what you've been doing. Now, when you look at the, uh, uh, the settlement pattern at 10, Remember your settlement patterns, grade 12. This is a rural area. This is a village. When you look at this, it's away from the city. It's away from the, uh, from the, uh, the urban area or the town. So it means that this is rural. When they ask you about the settlement patterns, they are referring to two settlement patterns that we have in geography. The first one is the dispersed settlement pattern. The following one, is the nucleated segment pattern. Now, when you look at this one on your map, you can see that this segment pattern, the buildings here or the segments are far away from from each other. They are far away from from each other. So this means that this now becomes your what? This becomes your what? Because the question says you must name the settlement pattern. Why, which pattern is this one? If you remember your settlement patterns. Let me just zoom it in here for you on the map. There. There you have it. The farmsteads here are far away from each other. Which means that this is what? This is our dispersed segment pattern. This is our dispersed segment pattern because the buildings are far away from from each other. The segments are located far away from each other. All right. Uh, let's move forward to 12. Um, state one physical or a, a natural factor that would have determine the type of settlement pattern identified. Why would they choose to, 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 to build in this settlement, in such a settlement pattern? The first thing that you look at here is that, um, first of all, the land there is gentle, flat land. There's flat land there. And another thing, these people are farmers. 
you can see that they are surrounded by sugar cane all over. They are surrounded by plantations, I mean, uh, which is, of course, sugar cane. But they are surrounded by plantations. Uh, also, the other point is that, as I have said, this is in the eastern side of the country. It means that they have what? Rainfall. They have rainfall, grade 12 here. They have rainfall. And also, access to water supply, because they are close to the river here. If you look uh, on the north part of this segment, is that there is a river there. You can see uh, two, three, there is a river. So this means that therefore, uh, these segments here, they are located next to, to the river. And another thing that you could have said, there is also a what? A road here. There is a road that runs here. So those are your, are your, are your answers that you were supposed to give for such. Now, now, let me just pause a bit on this and then talk about the other a, 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 a geomorphological question. That was actually included in your multiple choice of the in this paper of Pongol. Great twelve. You have a river between there is a river here. There is a river. You can see. And then there is two and three. And then the question that I have here says. If the examiner asks you to draw a cross section between two and three, how would you draw that cross section, grade 12? How do we draw such cross sections? First of all, you can see that the river is taking what is meandering, it's taking a bend. And remember, when a river takes a bend, this is a river. This is a river. There's water running. When a river takes a bend, let me use this bend here. It's meandering. When the river meanders, the inside of that meander, we call it as a slip off, where the river is depositing uh, uh, the load. And then the outside. There is a cliff on the outside of the river. That is where the river cuts. We call it the undercut. It is cutting the land. There is erosion the side and there is deposition the side. Now when someone says draw a cross section between a point 2 and 3, for example in this river, and here you say 2 and 3, it means that your cross section must be having something like, like this. It must show that next to B, or next to three, I mean, next to three is gonna be deep, and then next to two, the river is gonna be, be shallow. This is how you draw that cross section. You say two, and then say you say three. So in this situation, there you have it here in that bend. It's just a, a geomorphological question that I felt like it's necessary to highlight since I have passed the geomorphology questions there. So you must always remember that, grade 12. That this is how you actually uh, do your cross sections in this mat. Now let's go back to our, 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 our question here that was saying that we must state one physical factor and then we have mentioned them. Fertile soil, land is flat, there is rain, there is access to, to water supply. Those were expected answers. All right. It says here, state two economic advantage of the type of settlement pattern identified. What are the economic advantages? Now you remember when we still, we are in our uh, settlement geography, there is always going to be those two settlement pattern, the nucleated settlement pattern and the dispersed settlement pattern. 
there are advantages and disadvantages of those settlement patterns. And now they're asking you economic advantages. Look at our map clip. The farmer does not have to share his profit. That's the first thing. The farmer cultivates and all those cultivation, the farmer harvest, he does not share a profit with anyone. The farmer can also make his or her own decisions. Because the land is big, you don't need to, to, to have a conflict with anyone. If you decide to do what you want to do in that particular land, it's yours. You make your own decisions. And also there, there can be high productivity day. Because they are, they are not close to each other. The land is plentifully available. Uh, there is less labor cost. The farmer owns the land. Um, this one, the, uh, the, 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 the second last the one that says, farmer is able to mechanize uh, extensively. Because the farmer can use machines as much as, as he likes of, or as much as she, she likes. Because there is a big land, the land is big, it's available, there is available availability of, of land. Okay, now let's look at the following question. Now this question says, refer to the aerodrome in block D7 on the topographic map. And nine on the orthophoto map. So you must refer to both of them. Aerodrome in D7 and then the aerodrome in, 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 at nine in the orthophoto and the orthophoto map. Now when you look at these two, you can see that uh, I've clipped the, 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 I've made a map clip here for us to see. It is asking that in which land use zone is the aerodrome situated? So the aerodrome grade 12, again, this is a segment geography question on a map work though. You must know your land use zones, grade 12. You must know your land use zones. Remember we have our CBDs, our, our zone of decay, transition zones. We have our residential areas, we've got our industrial areas, and we have our 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 our, our rural urban fringe there at the end. And we also have our recreational areas or the green belts. This one, the aerodrome. Remember the aerodrome, this is a, a, a small landing strip for aeroplanes. Where the small aeroplanes come and land. Now when you think about it is that uh, it, it, it should not be located too close to the highly built areas, grade 12, because the aeroplanes would be coming there to land. So, why is it situated then to, to be there? Why is it, is it, is it, is it, uh, 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 okay, which, okay, the question says, which land use zone is the aerodrome situated? First of all, it is in a rural urban French, grade 12. It will be located in a rural urban fringe. The outskirts of the city, they, the transition between rural and urban, that is where you will find your aerodrome, your cemeteries, your, your, your recreational areas. Sometimes they are also located there in an open land. But these are the reason why is it situated there? Why is this land use zone a suitable location for the aerodrome? Flat land. The aerodrome needs to be located in flat land. Cheaper land. Away from the built up area. So that they can avoid accidents and for safety reasons. Availability of large piece of land. It means that there is an open space. And also the other reason is accessibility. When you look at the aerodrome, uh, next to the aerodrome there, there is a road. There is a road here next to the aerodrome. So it means that it is accessible. 
There is the our aerodrome. Just next to the aerodrome, there is a what? There is a road. There is a road. So it is accessible. It is accessible. Okay. And also due to pollution, to air and noise pollution, when the aeroplanes are landing, they will be a, a, a producing pollution and noise. So that is why it's far away from the built-up areas in the Royal Epen French. So the site is suitable for the aerodrome there. All right. Moving on. Uh, refer to slope 5 refer to slope 5 which is the low income residential area and slope 6 which is the high income residential area on the author photo map this question is from the Peter Marisbeck question paper this is from the Peter Marisbeck question paper now let's open our Peter Marisbeck question paper and scheme. All right, this is the Peter Marisberg question paper. This is the auto photo map. They say we must refer in land in land form five and six uh, on the auto photo map. Now, when you look at land form six. This is land form six. This is land form six. You can see the measures zoom in again. This is land form six, and then this one is land form five. When you look at these two land forms, now let's look at them from the map clip that I have. This is land form 5. See how it looks like. It's a low income residential area. And then this one, they say this one is the high income residential area. The question says, explain how aspect of the slope influence the site of the high income residential area 6. You can see uh, here, remember how to identify that this one is the high income and this one is a low income residential area. What you always look at is the plot of the stands where people are building their houses. If there are small stands, the plot of land, it means that that is the low income. If the plot of land are big, it means that it is a high income. And in this matter, we, we have um, a, a, a lot of trees in this segment and there's also top hill, meaning that top hill is a, is a, is a, is a, a town hill, I mean. Town hill is a, is, a, is a mountain. Remember that high income residential areas will want to be located uh, where there is a nice view. So that is why we have a town hill here. Here's our town hill. There, we have our town hill. Here, grade 12 is our town hill, meaning that residential area 6 is located on a nice view. There is a nice view there. Now, they are saying they explain how aspect influences the location of the site. Then, slope 6 is the north facing slope and experiences the, dir uh, uh, the direct sun's uh, rays, meaning that it receives the direct sunlight, making it warmer. This again is, is, is a sediment question, but based mainly on what? On climatology's aspect. Give one reason evidence on the autophoto map um, which influenced the location of the low income residential area at slope 5. Why do 
why why is it that low income residents will tend to build in this area okay the first thing that you should see there is there is a road there is a road remember the road is very important for the low income residential areas because these people mostly use public transportation to go to work and they have to go to work so they need public transportation and also you will see that the low income residential areas will also be located mostly next to the railway lines so why is this one uh, which is the factor that influenced the location of this one particularly it's next to the road for transportation access to places of work and another thing it is a south facing slope so uh, it has cheaper land uh, in comparison to slope 6 slope 5 is more gentle therefore it is cheaper the reason why it's going to be cheaper is because there is no nice view there and slope 6 has a nice view as i have explained that that high income people will want to build where they will be having a nice view it's also easy to build on that land. It's also close to the to the railway line. That is the factor that influenced them. They were the location of the site. Now, when you look at this question, we that uh, we can clearly see that we are talking about now the land use zone, which is the residential areas, and the, the residential areas are divided into into three. And those residential areas are the high income residential area, the middle income residential area, and the low income residential areas uh, you will excuse me Greta, if I'm a bit fast in my presentation uh, but I'm hoping that you are following uh, suggest how the natural vegetation could have influenced the land value of residential area 5 or 6 when you look at these two residential areas again in grade 12, remember that when you look at them, and let me just go back to this. A residential area 5, which is the low income, has fewer vegetation compared to residential 6, which is the high income residential area. It has many vegetation there are many trees there now how do how how does the trees influence the what the the value of the land okay suggest so how natural vegetation could have influenced the land values of residential areas five or six the vegetation grade 12 increases so if the vegetation uh, is there, it will it will actually make the land more beautiful. So at six there is more vegetation, therefore the land value increases. There is high land value at six. Or maybe you could have said lack of vegetation at five reduces the the, the aesthetic appeal, meaning that it is not beautiful. And that decreases land value. It's not nice. A place that does not have trees does not look nice. So, us as geographers, we know that trees are very important. So, that is why even when you look at this land value issues, the, the trees will influence the land value. If there are more trees in the area, the land would be the land value will be high. The importance of vegetation now is that vegetation uh, creates a cleaner uh, air because the trees absorb carbon. So vegetation creates a cleaner air. This area attracts more residents, more residents, and increases the land value. Now this this answer grade twelve also has to do with one of the topics that. Uh, I, I, I'm not able to actually cover it right now with you, but uh, you remember the city climate, the urban climate, 
which we, we define as then that there is a higher temperatures in urban areas compared to the surrounding rural areas. And then they give you the reasons for that is because in urban areas we have artificial surfaces, in urban areas we have a concrete roads, tar roads, we have industries and we have cars. And then the solution to that, the solution that is given to us, grade 12, that how do we reduce the impact of the urban heat island? We are always given a solution as a, a plant more vegetation is one of the uh, solutions. Meaning that it is very important that we understand that the vegetation is important for urban areas. And also vegetation lowers the temperature as I was saying. The, the vegetation, the way to lower temperature and the, the fact that this slope is a not facing slope, it means that it will be hotter in summer. So the vegetation helps, helps to regulate what uh, the temperature day and lower it down. All right. Uh, the following question says, um, identify and describe the pattern on the segment on this clip now i took this clip on purpose this was from the queenstown map but i took it and put it here in my presentation today so that you guys can see this because it's very important that you understand your what your 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 your, your street patterns and your street patterns are divided into there yeah, we have how many we have a the radial street pattern planned irregular street pattern unplanned irregular street pattern and then we have the a, 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 the grid stream a street pattern so those are the street pattern that we are talking about right now so this one in front of us the question says identify it first and then you describe it so this is a radial stream street pattern i mean this is a radial street pattern because the roads radiates or moves away from uh, the central point. So this becomes your radial street patterns. A great 12, uh, this one of street patterns and stream patterns. Now you hear what I'm saying now? I'm saying street patterns and stream patterns. Don't confuse those two. Don't go. Right now we have a radial stream pattern in Chomphology. And now I'm talking about the radial street pattern in segment geography. So you must always be aware of those. Um, now, uh, moving forward, let's look at this question. Uh, by the way, let me just take a pause a bit for that one of the stream of the street pattern i mean uh, let's look at, at 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 this situation how do you identify this street pattern you've already seen this one this one is radial because they are flowing away from the central from the central point there you have it ask us um when you look at this map of pomola let me just put the map of Pongola in front. And then uh, display it for you here. Let's look at, at what? This is the a, 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 a O. Let's look at O. O, let me just zoom it in for you a bit. O. Now, this street pattern here, you can see that the dominant stream pattern in this side, in this situation, this is a what? A grid. Now, when I talk about this, the normal the, the question will say, what is a dominant street pattern? Meaning that there could be many street patterns in, in, in one block, but which one is more dominant? And you should always choose according to which one appears the most in that in that situation. In this situation now, next to all this one, you can see that this one. Um, let me just highlight it for you. 
this street pattern. This street pattern grade 12 is planned, but it's irregular. There is a plan, but it's irregular. So you see, I'm asking you which one is more dominant in this particular situation. But when you look at the one circulated by O, it's a grid. Although there, there, there are some maps that will show you a grid iron street pattern much, much nicer uh, than this one. But it is a grid. So you must be able to know which one is more dominant and uh, so that you answer these questions accurately. So, okay. Okay, now this one says identify an account for the shape of the segment on this map. We have segment shapes. We have shapes of the segment. Remember I started with patterns and I said patterns is either nucleated or dispersed. And now I have a what? A, a, a shape of the segment. First of all, let me ask a question here that I want you to think about. In this map clip, we have a pattern. This pattern, is it nucleated or dispersed? Just think about it. Is it nucleated or dispersed segment pattern? And of course, you will say, this is a nucleated segment pattern. It's not the same as the one that we saw in area 10. In area 10, when we were looking at our area 10, we saw that the buildings were far away from each other. As you can see here, they are far away from each other. But when you look at it from now, from this one, the buildings are close to each other here, meaning that this is a nucleated. But the question really is saying, identify an account for the shape. What is the shape? A shape, correct? Well, when you speak of the shape, they are the shape that we speak of in geography. We have a linear shape, we have the circular shape or round. We have T-shape, we have crossroads. I mean, we, those are the shapes. And we also have a stellar one. I saw the other one on the question paper that was saying it's a stellar shape. So those shapes, grade 12, in this situation, there is something that is influencing the shape of the segment. And we can see which, 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 which factor is that one. What is influencing this one is that we have a road, which is our uh, N2. Now, when you look at this uh, road, you can see that uh, it is influencing the shape, and the shape here is then the linear shape, and it is linear along the main road. You see what I did there? I identify, and I'm accounting. Why is it like that? Why is it in a linear? Because when the question says I identified something, you just need to to give that this is a linear shape but when you account for that is that it is linear along the road okay um now grade 12 um now th those were the questions of what of of segment geography those were the segment geography questions those were the segment geography questions now when you look at this one now this question says refer to the agricultural activity in the mapped area this is the map area and then the question says is sugarcane farming as shown on the map an example of large or small scale farming Now, grade 12, when you look at this entire map, this entire map, this entire map, grade 12 of Pomola is cultivated. Most of it is cultivated, especially this part, because this one is mountainous. But still, even in the mountainous, you can still see plots of, of, of cultivations there. But you can see it is cultivated. So, ask this. This cultivation, grade 12, is sugarcane plantations. Now the question here says you have to identify the 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 the, 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 the agricultural activity here in the mapped area. 
And then they ask you, is this an example of a large scale or small scale farming? This, uh, this great wealth is a large scale farming. There is no way this can be a small scale farming. Here they use tractors, they have irrigation uh, schemes in the map you can see. In the map we've got furrows, that means that they, 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 transfer, they transfer water. We have canals. We, we, we have everything necessary for what for irrigation. So if, if there is this vast network of irrigation, it means that this is the a large scale farming and they use machinery to plant in this area. Okay, the following question says refer to the Pomola sugar mill in block F10 on the topographical map. Um, yes, and then and then and then there is the 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 the, the, the what uh, the sugar mill that they are referring to. Now, when you look at this sugar mill, grade twelve, in this block, the question says, is this a, 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 a what? A, um, the question here is not uh, okay. The question was that. A, is this an example of a raw material or a market oriented industry? That is the question. So the answer here says this is a raw material oriented industry. Simply because grade 12, these industries of the data called raw material oriented, they are located close to, to the raw material. They are located close to the raw material because they need to process that material that there should be an industry next to raw material and sugar cane is the raw material that the sugar mill needs so that is why this one becomes a what a raw material oriented industry if they ask you here give a reason for your answer that uh, in, in that question the reason is because sugar mills that processes the sugar cane are close to the plantations which is the raw material sugar cane requires a quick processing as it is uh, it can dry out uh, actually the sugar cane the raw material which is sugar cane is perishable Remember the sugar cane mill is used to is, is producing what sugar. The sugar that we use every day in the morning in our breakfast teas or whatever that we are eating. Um so these are some of the answers that we expected. Uh, sugar cane is uh, bulky to uh, uh, to transport and that increase the cost. Because when you transport sugar cane, it's just if you transport with those without processing it, actually, remember you have to squeeze the juices out of the sugar cane to get what to get uh, uh, those juices that you need to produce sugar. Now, if you transport sugar cane as big as it is, it becomes bulky. It means that there is a lot of load. It means that there are many trucks that need to go there and fetch the sugar cane. So that is why you need the industry to be raw material next to the raw material there. And also, um, a, a processed product is cheaper to transport. Once you have tra once you have made sugar, it's easy to transport sugar than transporting the raw material. Okay. Now, grade twelve. While I'm still in this one, I wanted to highlight uh, this one. Uh, let me go back to. So this map of Peter Marsbeck. In the map of Peter Marsbeck, there was a question. I did not include it because uh, it's a similar question. But this one, now when you look at this map, they say in the question, um, industries that are located uh, in, in area 8, and you can see area 8. And in area 8, you can see that there are industries in area 8. These are the industries. These are the industries. And then they ask you, the question that was there was that, um, 
in the Peter Marsberg 20, 2018 question paper was are these industries an example of raw material or market oriented now the answer for that question was that these are the uh, 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 the market oriented industries because they are located closer to people look look here there's a fantastic element of peter respect it's located closer to 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 the market which are people who are going to come and buy those products and also where they can sell those products they are located closer to people so that is why these industries are, are, are called uh, the what uh, the market oriented compared to to this one of pomola uh, you can see here that it is actually located next to raw material uh, pomola this is the sugar mill so there is a lot of sugar mill around pomola which makes this as raw material and make that one of peter marisbeck as market oriented industries now this is the, the, the these are the questions of economic geography now uh, amongst other questions grade 12 generally so excuse uh, let me just bring back my map thank you now these are the most common questions in the previous um what examinations they will be asking you and saying what is the benefit of the n2 what will be the benefit of the n2 passing through pomola what will be the benefit for motorist meaning that if you are driving a car what would be why is it so much beneficial for you to pass through the town of pomola okay what what is it that the, the, the motorists will do when they come to Pomola? They will have to go out of their car, fill their petrol. They can fill up their gas tanks, their their petrol tanks. I mean, and then they will also get refreshments, get to rest, some rest. Nyana, they need to rest. So they benefit in that way. Or maybe the question that I saw from Hersmith said. What are the disadvantages for the road passing through uh, the, the, the N2 passing uh, through uh, Pomola? What are the disadvantages for the area? If that question can come in this situation that you are in right now, I would just say, but, uh, uh, particular, this is just me thinking that because we are living in difficult times of Corona, people that would be traveling in this N2 might actually be traveling along with the virus there and then they bring it in the town but again the most common answer that you can give for that is that um when they pass in pomola they're going to slow down there might be traffic there these those are disadvantages for the motorists and also for the town and also there is a question that says what are the advantages what are the benefits of the end to passing in Hersmith for businesses that are located in Pongol? I mean, yeah, I guess for saying Hersmith, they it's just that this question that I'm trying to allude on now, I got it from the Pongola, uh, in general, from the Hersmith question paper. So, what are the benefits for businesses that are located in Pongol? These motors they come here, they stop, they fill their gas tanks. And then what they do, they bring money. They bring money. So people will benefit today. There will be employment. Businesses will be having money. And those are some of the things. All right. Now, grade 12. I'm going to conclude my, uh, my, uh, my, my interpretation section. And remember, the interpretation section is the, is, 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 is the one that is having more marks. That is why I've spent this much time trying to, to explain the interpretation of, of the map. Great 12, please. Eh, 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 now, listen to me now carefully. You must always be prepared. Go through your theory. The map that we use as, 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 as teachers 
we can transfer these questions to another map. They still apply. Just be aware. These questions can come from anything. So it's a matter of you being knowledgeable in geography that you must be aware of everything possible that can be asked in a map. They can ask you anything, absolutely anything there. So, um, uh, 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 while I'm still on that, um, I, will, I will actually want us to actually uh, take a short break before we go for our GIS. Okay, um, geographers, we are back from our short break. And so far, we have uh, done the calculations. Um, and uh, uh, we have done the interpretation of the map where I spent a lot of time trying to explain. Uh, now we are going to go to our question four, which is geographic information systems, GIS. And this part of your paper will be having 15 marks, grade 12. We'll be having 15 marks in this part of our a, 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 a question paper it will be 15 marks so you must always remember that now when you when you look at this picture in front of you right now is you can see that this is the uh, these are the components of gis actually you have your software your data people hardware and applications so when you look at it the, the component the first thing that i want to look at now with this one grade 12 you must follow me closely with this one I'm going to try and uh, make sure that you understand the concept of geographical information system uh, 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 as, 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 as quickly as possible. First of all, when we speak about geographic information system, we look at the components of it first because the definition of what is GIS has to do with your components. You see the components? Data, applications, hardware, people, software, it doesn't matter how you put them, but as long as you have you know your what your, your, your components of, of GIS grade 12. So what you have here is that what is GIS? GIS is an organized collection of hardware, software, data, people, and methods that is used to capture store, manipulate, and display geographic data. Great, well, you see the reason why, let me, let me go back. I said to you, know your component first. The reason for me saying that is because your definition of GIS has to do with the components of GIS. So once you know the components, it's easy to define GIS. You just put the components there, the collection of hardware, software, data, people, and method that is used to capture, manipulate, store, display geographic data. Okay, so once we have this, this is, this is critical, grade 12. Which role is played by people in GIS? Which role do we play as people? Because this is this this GIS is for us. So the first thing that we do, we develop uh, the programs. We are the ones who develops the program. Uh, by the way, you see when I talk about these components, these components, great work, Listen to me. You know GIS. You can think of something like, let's say you are baking a cake. You, know? you bake a cake. You don't have you don't have sugar or flour. They won't be a cake. These are ingredients. All these things, they go together, grade 12. You must have a hardware. You must have... If one of these components is not there, there will be no GIS. Let's make an example. If there is no hardware, remember hardware, hardware, those are computers. That is a computer. Just a computer, a monitor, a mouse. And then your software, these are your programs inside the computer. The data is what you feed inside the system. Who feeds the system? is people and then when you try to get information or to do something with that GIS 
then you use a method or procedure. Okay, let me go back. This is what the role that we play. People uh, are the developers of the program. People collect data. The reason why there is data inside the computer there is because people have collected the data. People manipulate and process the information. People use the information. We are the ones who uses this information uh, at grade 12. We don't, we don't create this information and then it's used by someone else. We are the ones who actually use uh, that information. Uh, so in which ways is data collected? Uh, which ways people collect data for GIS? People, we, when we collect data, we, we, we go out, we do surveys and, and questionnaires, we go and ask people. We, we use photographs in, in, in geography. We know the importance of, of, of photographs in geography. We also use what? The remote sensing, the satellite image. We go to Google Earth, then we scroll down, we get our information, we get our data. We sometimes test the natural environment. We go and get the soil sample, the water quality. We go there physically, we test them. And also we use physical measurements and using secondary data. That is how we actually uh, 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 get our, 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 our data. We also use existing maps. Like right now, I have existing map of what? Uh, auto photo and the, and the topographical map. It is an existing map but they also form part of the way we collect data because right now if I were to do GIS and ask uh, maybe uh, uh, the question could be how much area is covered by uh, the, 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 the what the, 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 the town of uh, Pomol I have already this data I can get it here I get that data here, that information I get it here. So that's how I'm collecting the information of this map, how much land is covered. Okay. Um, and now let's go back to the presentation and see. So uh, now we collect the data, I have said. What type of data do we collect in GIS? We collect two types of data, grade 12. We collect the spatial data and then we collect the attribute data. Those are the two types of data that we have that we collect uh, in GIS. Um, what is a spatial data? If I said to you, please follow me carefully on this one. Spatial data uh, refer to the position of an object. Uh, in other words, its coordinate. The fact that something exists in space we call it a spatial data. It is the spatial mean space. For example, a mountain is there. That is a spatial data. A mountain is there. A river, it exists. It's something that we can study. A river is, is, is what? It's spatial. It's just there. And then a, a, a road. It could be a road. The road is just there. It exists in space. It is there. It, there is a position for that road. It could be a school. School is the, it could be a church. It is a spatial object in, in geography. It is there in space. Okay? It exists. But when we look at what we call attribute data, attribute data now, we say the attribute data is the information that describes or gives the characteristics of an object. That's what I, I have. A mountain. It's just that that is special. But if I say this is mountain Kilimanjaro, mountain Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa. It is five thousand eight hundred and ninety-three meters above the sea level. What did I just do now? I have given the description, which means that I'm giving attribute. That is attribute data grade twelve. You see, I said to you here on special data these are just there in space they exist but on attribute i'm giving description i'm describing i'm giving characteristics it's a mountain Kilimanjaro highest this is a road special but once i say the road is a tar road is 93 kilometers long i'm giving an attribute of that uh, 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 of what of that object of that road so grade 12, you, that is very important that you, you, you understand the difference between the two. And then from there, once we have collected data, 
we have to store that data or represent it. Okay? We are representing data. In GIS, we represent data in two ways that the data is also represented. We have vector data models and the raster data models. You get me, grade 12. Once we have collected information and we, 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 we have collected spatial data and the attribute data, we have to store that data, meaning or represent it or display it in vector data or raster data. Now let's look at this vector data. When data is represented using points, lines, and polygons. When data is represented using points, lines, and polygons, that is vector data. There is an example. These are points, lines, and polygons. Um, These are points. Okay, my presentation uh, got stuck there a bit. These are points. For example, your windmill, your monument, your tower, water tower, your 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 your, your trigonometric stations, your 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 reservoirs. Those are points. Your lines would be your roads, your railway, your 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 your, your, your power lines, your rivers, and then your polygons would be your dams your cultivated lands, your built-up areas, your cement trees, your aerodromes, they inform what? Those are part of polygons. So this is an example here. A topographical map, grid 12, is an example of a information stored in, in what? In a form of, of a, a vector data. Because you can clearly see in this map, in this map, grid 12, you see we have points, we have points, in an example of this block, we have points of a reservoir, we have uh, uh, buildings that are points, we, we've got what? We've got lines, the, the, the freeway here is a line, uh, we, we have another other road here, the, the, the smaller road, we have fence as a line, the river is a line, and then we've got polygons, the dam is a polygon. The built-up area is a polygon. Uh, the aerodrome is a what? Is a polygon. The recreational area is a polygon. Uh, with this now, you must be careful that sometimes they just say go to block maybe F5 and then identify any line feature. If they specify in a block grade 12, it means that you are now you must identify that in that particular block. Do not say there is a road in that block when there is obviously no road in that block. Okay. All right. Now let's go and see. Um, of course, the topographical map is an example of what of a vector data model. The raster data model, on the other hand, is represented using pixels. The pixels grade twelve. We use pixels to represent data on a on a on, on which map? Where we use pixels? Okay. Let me just go through this first, and then I'll show you. Uh, this is the auto photo map. The the, 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 the name of the map is auto photo photo meaning that this is a picture okay so uh, 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 as I said and, and, and there you have it in, 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 in your map you can see this is a picture this is the, 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 the picture that was taken by an aeroplane then we put uh, control lines there to make it a map uh, but it's still a picture there are pixels in that while we are still in the in the matter of pixels, look at this question that says refer to the topographical map. Is the topographical map an example of vector, of raster or vector? There you have it. It is a vector. 4.1.2. What is the difference between raster data and vector data? A, a raster data is represented by pixels, cells, grid, blocks. Uh, while a vector data is data represented as points, lines, and and polygons, as I have said, while we are in the, in, in 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 the issue of points, lines, and polygons, or of what, of 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 pixels, we have to talk about the spatial resolution. Spatial resolution. Now, great twelve. Listen to me now. In a matter of spatial resolution, here we are actually just referring to the, uh, uh, 
the degree of clarity and details of a of a of a, of a, a picture of a photo make an example here if i have two phones i've got a map a mobi cell and an iphone i took i take a picture of something the the iphone have more megapixels meaning that uh, it is has a what a higher resolution that image because there are many pixels in a in a what in a in, a, in, a, in an iphone but if i use a maybe a mobile for example let me say an iphone has a 24 megapixels but a a, a, a mobile has 8 megapixels it means that the picture taken by an iPhone is going to be highly resoluted and then the picture taken by the, uh, uh, the mobile cell will be low resolution. Alright. Now let's look at this. Um, this here is an example of a high resolution image. I got this image from the Google Earth. Uh, this is the school ETAB thing where I teach. Uh, you can see here this picture shows that the school is having higher resolution compared to this one the low resolution would be this one you can see clear the grade 12 on the first one that has high resolution you can see that there is the admin block there is the block and another block there there is the the, the, the kitchen they you can see there are cars in the parking uh, lot that you can see it's clear to see that matter on image number two which is a low resolution you can't see anything because the pixel look at the size of those pixels the size of those pixels are too big the size it, it themselves matter the actual number of pixels are actually few what do i mean look at this let's say you take a picture then you zoom in the picture when you zoom into a picture do you see do you normally notice that the quality of the picture is reduced that is because when you zoom into the picture, you are expanding the pixels. You are expanding them. But you are not adding the num, the actual number of pixels. Instead of adding them, you are eliminating them because some other things that were on that picture are no longer visible in that picture. So that is about resolution in 12. Alright, now let's look at this. Uh, your Pongola question paper said uh, um, image A and image B were captured by a remote sensing device. Okay. Now let's let's look at these two images. You can see that this image A and B. And then the first question is that what is remote sensing? What is remote sensing? I said to you I took this picture from my school. I took it from above. I was using remote sensing. I was using Google Earth. I scrolled down and then I cropped the picture. What is remote sensing? Remote sensing is, 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 is what? Is obtaining information about the earth from distance without touching or physical contact. You don't need to go there. For example, right now I can just go to the computer, zoom into to Deben. I'm in Deben right now, but I'm not there. It means that grade 12, we can be able to study things as geographers in places that are not accessible to us. You can study something from a, from a, what, a distance. So this is what is happening here. So, um, so the, of course, the obtaining information about the earth from distance without touching or without physical contact. Okay. Name one factor in the remote sensing process that will affect the resolution of an image. What can affect the resolution of an image? Let's say you are taking a, a, a picture today, but the weather conditions is cloudy. There are clouds today. You're going to have a, a, a what? A lower resolution of that image because you can't see details. Because remember, they said this amount of clarity and details of the picture, the focus, the number of pixels, the shadow, the equipment. As I've saying, as I was saying, if you use a camera with high megapixel you will then have a, a, a nicer picture. If you are using a, 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 a camera with a low megapixel, you will then have a, a, a blurry picture. Air pollution. If there is smoke outside, you can't see clearly. Distance. How far are you from that object? Angle in which you capture the image and also the scale of the map that you are using is very important. That is why the two maps, in, in the two maps, that is why the two maps we say, um, between these two maps, 
we always say, just show you this, between these two maps, uh, we say, um, that's all. This game, I'm talking about this game now again. Okay? We say the auto photo map has higher resolution than the topographical map than this one because of the scale. Scale here it means that you can clearly see details of things in this map, but you cannot see clearly details of, of this map. Why so? Let's make an example a school in this map. A school is represented by a dot. There is a dot, then that is a school. But in this map, a school, you will see a block, buildings. You'll see buildings of the school that, oh, this is a school. Actually, there is an admin block. There is what? You can clearly see, though, that is why we say it has higher, higher resolution than a dot that was represented in this map. Okay. I hope you understand that. And then. Now look at this question, why does image A has a higher resolution than B? Obviously the reason for that is because uh, the reason for the higher resolution for this image is should talk, it should speak about what? About the number of, of pixels. Image A it has more smaller pixels. I mean there are many pixels, okay, in that image, higher megapixel. But image B has less Pixels, meaning it's a low mega megapixel pitch. Which map, auto photo or topographical map, has a higher resolution? Give a reason for your answer. Okay, auto photo map has a higher resolution because all features are big and clear, as I was showing you here. I'm not gonna show you again, but in J, you must be aware of what I'm talking about. Grade 12. Because these things are very important. Look at the arrow drawn on the on the on the what? On the auto photo map. Very big and clear. You can see that this is an arrow drawn. Look at the arrow drawn uh, from the topographical map. I've already made a mark on it, Mara. You can see it's so small here. It's very small. So that is why this one is having a higher resolution. Great 12. And then from there we talk about data layer in grade 12. This is a very important concept over the years in geography, in GIS. When different kinds of information are placed on top, one on top of another, again, you take a different layer, you put it on top, you take another layer, you put it, what does it mean? Now look at me now what I'm demonstrating. It means that you have to develop a map, let's assume. You go out in your area, the way you are right now, you go out and you map all schools. When you come back from mapping all schools, you're gonna come back with a spreadsheet, that's what we call a spreadsheet in geography. You come back with that thing, you put it in a computer. It's going to show you schools as what? As, 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 which, as which representation as points. You're gonna see schools there. You go out again, you collect information about the road of that particular area. You map all the roads, you come back with another layer. When you put them together, you're going to have now a combination of schools and roads. You are putting that in on top to see what an overall picture. At the end of the day, once you put, for example, roads, schools, rivers, uh, what else maybe? Um, a population, number of people, you, you are going to get, end up having what? A overall, overall picture. Then you have it there, street, buildings, vegetation, integrate, and in, this is an integrated that. Do you see how does the final product look like? It looks like a proper map, but they are different layers. They are being placed one on top of another. You have a choice between two sides. Now let's talk about data layering now. This one, you have a choice. This is the uh, 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 between to build a mall between this U in block E7. So it's between T and U. There is T and there is U. Which one? Look at these two places. Where will you build a mall, a shopping center, shopping mall? Where will you build it between T and U? Okay, let's make let's make your choice now. You will you. you 
the, 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 the question says, give two data layers evident on the topographical map that you will use to assist you in making your choice. The layers now, when you look at this map, look at this clip in front of you. There are different layers in this map. There are layers of roads. We call those layers as infrastructure road, in general, as infrastructure layer. There is layer of what? Of 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 uh, of, of of topography, where we have your spot heights, your your contour lines. We have also the layer of land use. It must be next to the to the market. Okay. It must also be behaving out in open space. Those are different layers. There is also something that we call a drainage layer, where you, when you see dams, rivers, those are drainage layers. We also have agricultural layer here, where you have your cultivated land, your orchard and vineyards, um, and maybe row of trees. We call them as what well, is agricultural layer. Okay, so there is your answer there. All right. Which one side, which side is suitable between U and V? We say that here uh, 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 U is suitable uh, because obviously we saw that at V, the control lines were steep at V. At T, I mean, at T, you see T there, you can't build them all day, it's away from people. You can't build them all day. Control lines are too steep. There's a natural park there. It's just not suitable. But when you look at V, you look at U, you can see that it's very nice. The, the control lines are gentle and then everything is just there. All right, let me go fast. Data integration. Now, the difference between the two is that here we are combining uh, 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 we combining of different sources of information to give the user a unified view. What do you do by that? Look at this. You are combining a map. Let's say here we have a map. One is to 50,000, another map, one is to 80,000, another map, one is to 30,000. Look at the, when you combine them together, you have a unified view and you put it in one map of one is to, is to 50,000. You see, you have combined them. You are not putting them on top of each other, grade 12. Okay? You are not putting them on top. Putting it on top of each other is data layering. But when you take an auto photo map and drop whatever map and combine it, you get a what? data integration you integrate them the plan view of the scratch below is showing that this is the what now this is a data integration is an example of data integration this is a plan view okay what is happening here now is that explain the term data integration of course is the combi uh, combining of different sources of information to give the user a unified view name two sources that could have been used to obtain information to produce this scratch. How do you unify this? You take topographical map, auto photo maps, satellite image, aerial photographs. You, you combine them. Then you have what? A, a data integration there. Okay, now we are almost at the end of this presentation actually. The most important concept that I've left behind here is the concept of buffer railing. A lot of buffering I mean, not the way buffer railing, buffering. Buffering now grade 12 becomes very important in our geomorphology. In fact, in anything that we do, we, we, we speak of the buffer. Uh, what is buffering? What, what is buffering? What is buffering? Uh, what is buffering? Buffering grade 12 is when you demarcate an area around or along a special feature. It is a, a certain, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a what? It's a river. You demarcate it. By demarcating it, in, 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 in real life, you'll be maybe putting a fence on the river because people are polluting the river. Or maybe you are protecting a well or a borehole somewhere. You do around it. That is what, what you call buffering. Okay, now this is an example referred to buffering in block H8 on the topographical map. What is buffering? So of course, you demarcate an area around the, or along the spatial feature. Why will the lack of buffering be considered as a poor river management in Block H? If the river is not protected, grade 12, people will dump thing in the, uh, polluted things in the river, Anger. So that is why we say that it should be buffered. Okay? Uh, there will be fertilizers or pesticides 
the river could lose water due to uh, excessive irrigation. Flooding may result. This biodiversity could be threatened in the river. Soil erosion could build up. The, these are some of the answers grade 12 that you could provide. But the, the, the last answer is the, is the most important and the easiest answer. The last one which says river is not protected. Buffering is for protection in this instead of a river. Application. Now here grade 12 I just uh, put a summary. I got this from uh, uh, some slides and then I put them in my presentation here because I felt like when you speak about publication, you must know why. Why do we have to have GIS? Because but you can't just develop a system where we don't know why we are using it. How are we using it? We, we need to develop the GIS to solve problems. We must solve problems. So these are some of the, of the applications. These are most common applications that we have in, in, in GIS uh, here. Let's say we want to build a shopping center as we have seen. Things that you look for when you want to build a shopping center, GIS will be able to tell you the, uh, the, the, the availability of plots, the cost of plots, distance from other shops, clients, uh, uh, buying power, how are, are people working in that area? Uh, so you must be able to, 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 to answer such questions. If you want to open a shop of Nike, you must know uh, people are, are they fan of that brand in that particular area. Floods is another one, the most common one. Before you build, you must be in a position to determine whether the area is prone to flooding. Okay? So what do you look at in that particular thing? You look at the relief, the history of that kind of that particular place. Has it ever affected by floods? How how high is it from the, 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 the river or the sea? The rainfall, because when a flood will have rain. Okay, flood line, okay, the bridges, the residential areas affected, the evacuation routes, you look at those things. And then for crime, the type of crime that people normally will have, the location, where are they doing that crime? At what time, around what time do they normally commit that crime? Frequently, how long, how often does that crime okay? Okay, risky zones, which one, which zones are the highest risk? Okay, the characteristics in the neighboring areas. So, when you ask about the application of crime, you must be able to, to know that the, 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 the answer should range from uh, these uh, points here that you have in front of you. Let's look at this last question here. It says, refer to the topographical map uh, and the autophoto map. So, this is the Peter Marisbeck map. They were showing us the crime percentage uh, over the years, house break, um, uh, Town Hill 18.6%, Car Hijack 100%, Mountain Rise 11%. This is a, another area there, so these are two different areas. Now they say name one way in which the data above could have been collected. The information above grade 12 could have been collected from the police station. You, you know it's about crime, you go there and ask. Maybe there is a questionnaire, you ask people, uh, uh, there is a national crime stats. Maybe sends us or you got it from, from the internet. Okay. Is this information in the table above primary data or secondary data? Because this information is already there, it means that this is secondary data. Primary data, remember, primary data is when you go to the field and do the field work. That's when you obtain primary data. And I know this year around many of you grade 12 did not get the opportunity maybe to go because of COVID-19 you did not get an opportunity to go and uh, and ask people questions because you for safety uh, but the primary data is when you go to the field and collect it first hand but this one now is already there so it's secondary which type of crime has shown the highest percentage increase uh, is the high, uh, car hijack you can see here is 100% uh, in in view in, in Town Hill and in Mountain Rise is uh, uh, 177%. So it is uh, rising up. So the importance of, of course, analyzing these statistics, it assists the people to solve the crime 
uh, the police where we should we develop the police stations and everything these are some of the answers you can go through some of these answers so that you you, you, you are able to uh, to do this so great wife, this brings me to the end of my presentation now uh, for today uh, now what you must remember grade 12 is to stay calm in the examination uh, prepare practice makes perfect and then uh, everything would be uh, fine and uh, thank you again and uh, by the way if you wish to to contact me in any way for help in geography you can always get me in this number uh, 060 34 35 37 9 Thank you very much, geographers. All the best for your paper on uh, this day. Thank you.